I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you for coming. Um, the presentation that we have today is Factory Shutdowns, Displaced Workers, and the Role of Community Colleges in the Global Economy. And our speaker is Dr. Dave Cochran. He's a professor of history here. And uh, what he's going to talk about is in 2006, the Maytag plant in Heron closed down and displaced about 1,000 workers. 400 of those came here to John A. Logan College for retraining. Well, in the fall of 2012, Dave took a sabbatical and he did interviews with some of those displaced workers and he has some insights into what really happened and he's here to share those with you. Thank you. Rick, do I need to stand still or can I pay? Okay. Um, thank you. I want to thank Tom and uh, Rick Burkett for setting this up. Um, and Tom gave you the, the bare bones of what this is about. I'll just say one thing is that the, um, the 400 students who came to school here or others went to SIU or Rin Lake or other colleges, they went on a Free Trade Adjustment Act which allowed for two years of education in any field as long as it ended in some kind of certification or degree that would lead to a job. And the FTAA grant was administered by Mantracon, which is a nonprofit state agency designed to help, in the words of its website, create quality workforce solutions. Those of us who were here um, in 2007 through about 2010 or so, uh, experienced the Maytag workers coming through school here, and, and we got a sense of what exceptional people they were. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed having, I always enjoy having non-traditional students who can bring their uh, life experiences. We got seats down here, Victoria. So, um, and so I enjoyed teaching them, but I have to admit, I didn't think about it very much. And then a few years later, I had a friend of mine come down from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he was visiting, and we were talking, and I told him about the Maytag plant shutting down and what a devastating impact it had on the local economy. And he asked me, so what did your students, the, the Maytag workers, what did they think? How did they explain what happened to them and their role in the global economy and, and how it had this local impact. And I was really embarrassed to admit I never bothered to ask them when I had them here. So a few years later, I came up with a proposal for um, a sabbatical leave. And my proposal was to go back and find these workers and uh, ask them what they thought, you know, what, ask them about their work at the factory, whether we were helpful in retraining them, and then ask them the big question of what did they think. Uh, the, um, what did they think of, of their position in this global economy? And so I put together a proposal and I sent it to the uh, sabbatical committee and they were very supportive and they approved it. But I got questions from the sabbatical committee and I got questions from a lot of my colleagues and other people about why, why exactly are you doing this and what exactly are you going to do? And I had a lot of people say, that's a great idea that you really should, uh, in fact, you should do a statistical analysis of who came to school here and who didn't come to school and the people who came to school here, how, what kind of jobs did they get? And I thought, you know, that's a great idea. And when you do your sabbatical and you do that statistical analysis, I'm going to want to read it. But, you know, that sounds too much like counting, which sounds too much like math. And uh, there are a lot of reasons some of us go into history, and one of the main ones is we don't want to do math. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, and then I was talking to a, a relative of mine, and she said, yeah, you know, that's a great idea. Talk to the workers. You should also talk to Whirlpool, you know, the management there, and get their view on why they wanted to shut down this factory. And uh, I thought, no, you know what? I don't really have any interest in 
getting the rationalization from Whirlpool of why they wanted to engage in this kind of creative destruction, which at the local level, as you drive around here, and looks a lot more destructive than it does creative. So, now, what I wanted to do was just get stories. I wanted to talk to people, find out, you know, their lives. Engage in what are called oral histories, which historians, you know, I tell my students this, one of the problems of studying history is we usually look from the point of view of people in power. Um, politicians, business magnates, you know, generals, uh, cultural leaders. You know, we usually look from the position of people in power. And, and we, you know, so it's a very top-down view of history. Uh, what my advisor back at the University of Missouri called history in the missionary position. Um, so I, uh, but there are certain areas, certain ways where we can sort of try to get a handle on those people who don't have power. You know, how does history happen to them or how do they make history? Uh, and oral history provides a nice way to get a hold of uh, what the great Italian anti-fascist theorist Antonio Gramsci called the subaltern classes. Those are people who don't have easy access to, to power. You know, and so oral histories provide a way to do that. And um, so I went around and I got names and I talked to some really impressive and, and amazing people. Um, and they, they shared their stories with me. It's really interesting how I did this. A lot of my colleagues got me names of former students. And then when I talked to people, they would say, oh, you should talk to this person and this person. And, and uh, you know, other people are giving me names. One woman said, oh, my ex-husband worked at Maytag. You definitely need to talk to him, which I thought was impressive because it means she gets along with her ex a whole lot better than I get along with mine. Um, but... Uh, you know, so I, I, I taped these stories, I had them transcribed, or I transcribed them myself. And, um, you know, people were really generous in sharing their, their stories to me, uh, or with me. But, you know, the way, um, a lot of problems with oral history. Um, we've got some seats over here, we've got some right over here. Um, a lot of problems, uh, some of the problems with oral history, and one is the way people talk is just a lot different than written language. And there's the danger, you know, because when you talk, you don't see it, and so you have a tendency to, to engage in a lot of kind of connecting words or uh, that you wouldn't use speaking. So I would try to write these out and then let people go over their written, or a written transcript of their spoken talk. And I had one guy tell me, I never realized I started every sentence with so until I read, you know, what I had spoken. So, you know, I'm trying to do justice and capture the voices of the people I talk to. And I hope I've, I've done that, and I really am grateful to all the, the people who shared their stories with me. So, um, in my classes, my students can tell you, I spend a lot of time talking about the nature of work. Um, and uh, especially in my 202 class, I focus a lot on the revolution in the uh, nature and structure of work that took place in the early 20th century, what was called scientific management, or it's also called Taylorism. And uh, it was a really a concerted effort on the part of industrialists to take control of the work away from the workers and give it all to management. And then they would, reor they would do a series of time and motion studies where they reordered work and they would get work down to the simplest repetitive motion. So all wasted movement is eliminated. And um, the consequence of scientific management for the workers is, first of all, it takes away all autonomy. It takes away all individualism. And it, uh, at least from the workers' point of view, it, it destroys the older tradition of craft skills. Before this process of scientific management, Work was something the workers knew how to do, and they would uh, take years sometimes to learn this skill that they had. And, uh, and scientific management, again, is aimed at taking that away, and it also destroys a lot of the old Protestant work ethic, the idea 
you know, that work in and of itself, hard work is meaningful. All right. So the first thing I did when I talked to the Maytag workers was I asked them, just what did you do? Like on the assembly line, what was your work? And some of the descriptions were really impressively intricate. I had one woman say, it was just assembly of different parts and screws or clips and untangling wires or putting stickers on and just a lot of manual labor with your hands. Everyone who talked to me like used their hands as they were describing what they did at work. You couldn't separate the physical movement from the description. So she goes on, lots of small parts and probably one of the most odd skills for me, I thought, that I had to learn was to roll small screws. You wouldn't realize how important it was, but all those tiny screws in a machine or in a part in your fingers, you had to learn how to roll them quickly to get them into your machine, you know, to get them into your screw gun. Because you'd hold a whole handful in your palm and just roll them and go as quick as you could. The dryer line was producing like 900 and something machines a day per shift, and then the washer line was at 1,500 or something a day, so there were quite a lot of screws because you put in at least three or four per machine, at least. And the speed and the numbers of workers uh, on the line put a whole lot of pressure on individual workers. As one told me, there are jobs when you're constantly putting screws in the cabinet and you make one little mistake and get a screw in crooked or something, you start getting behind and everybody starts getting mad at you. At the same time, talking to people about their jobs made me really rethink a lot of my uh, sort of simplistic, facile assumptions about scientific labor, or scientific management. One of the points I traditionally make when teaching is that the work is not really difficult. You know, at least mentally it's not difficult. It, physically it can be really demanding. But according to an engineer at the plant, he said that the human element, that is calling on the skill and judgment of the individual workers, was crucial, especially since it was such an old factory. He said, we underestimate the value of human beings that have great hand-eye coordination, and they know how things feel, and they adapt to changes in the product, and so they know pretty quickly how good stuff feels and how bad parts feel. Everything goes together a little bit differently. None are exactly the same. If you can install machines in hazardous areas or reduce repetitive motion in injuries, then fewer people are at risk, and that's good for the production line. You're taking care of the workers. But an old plant with old machines is sometimes more variable when making parts. And we found out that we needed people on the line because the people can and are willing to make the adjustments. So you could put it together where a robot or automation couldn't and still get a good product out of it. Human beings gave us flexibility that we could never get out of machines. In the same way, when I talk about scientific management, I, I make the point that it alienates the worker from the product, that uh, like a, a craftsman who has spent years developing a skill and he hand makes a product, feels a sense of investment and a sense of pride in that product, whereas if you just make a couple of repetitive motions, you don't have a connection to that product uh, out there. And um, one worker very quickly corrected that assumption that I had always made. She, I asked her, so when you saw a Maytag machine, did you feel a sense of personal investment in it? And she said, if you were just doing whatever job every day, you know, just filling in for someone, you didn't have the same pride. Whenever you actually had your job, and that was your position, and you knew you were accountable for those three screws in the back of the cabinet, or putting those five knobs on, you knew that it better be done right. You didn't want it coming back and someone saying, wow, you did a horrible job. You wanted to make it look as good as possible. I did take a little bit more pride in it. It meant more to me at the end of the day. I'm really doing a pretty good job here. You can look and see that they went down and that they had been boxed and you could see it. It made you feel good. So, as we talk about in my 202 class, you know, a big part of the goal of scientific management is to take control away from the workers. And what I found as I talked to people is they still found ways to try to exert control over their product, uh, as much control as possible. One worker commented that he liked to get as far ahead as he could of the line, and then he would pull out a book and he would read until the line caught up. Um, Another told me one, say he said, once you, got a good, once you got good at what you were assigned to do, it was pretty easy. So many hooks would come by and you could count them out and you knew. So you could let the empty ones go so far down and then you just, you know, hang them right back up. And then you stand there and you talk or do whatever because the work was just steady pace with the conveyor. As long as you could keep up with that, the rest of the time was yours. 
So one of the um, engineering department's jobs was to try to cut down on this worker control of the time. You know, even though workers don't have very much control, they still have a little bit, and so management's still trying to take away that little bit of time. Uh, one engineer I talked to, and he, was, he called himself a time study guy. He went onto the shop floor and learned the, the various jobs, he said, to find out what the work really is and where the complications are. What looks like easy work to a bystander might in fact have taken years of practice by the person doing it, and it just looks easy, but it's actually quite difficult. So he learned the jobs, and then he raised the subject of trying to increase productivity, which workers typically resisted. He said, making people work more proficiently in that place is often seen as making them work harder, and no one liked that. First, you had to show them what they were doing was easier than the jobs around them, easier than it ought to be. Once that was done, most of the folks eventually admitted they could probably take on a little more work. When they accepted that I had their best interest in mind as well as the companies, it worked out okay. That was the tough part of the job. I worked for the company, but I also worked closely with the union, and they have to have a reason to trust you if they're going to accept your changes. If they don't trust you, you got nothing done. So you go out on the floor, you pay attention to folks that have never seen an engineer on the floor before, and you use their suggestions to make the process and the product better. From the worker's point of view, though, time study not only resulted in lost control over what free time they had, but it also usually cut their pay. As one guy told me, they started retooling. And when they retool, they re-time study. And when they re-time study, they cut your pay big time. It's always an excuse to cut people's pay because it was piece rate. So they cut my pay almost in half. Um, several people pointed out to me that the good workers at the factory tended to get taken advantage of. Um, one guy said, being young and strong and just out of the army, I could do a wide variety of jobs. And you find out real quick that if you're a good worker, they'll abuse you because there's a lot of people that don't want to work real hard. Another told me about a banner that used to hang up at the uh, entrance to the factory, and it said, your quality is your job insurance. Good work means more work. And he laughed. He said, now, you can take that several ways, and I, I know how they meant it, but in the plant, you got the drones that get by doing nothing, and you got the guys that are going to do the job. The guys that do their job end up doing their job and that guy's job. Every time I think about that sign... That symbolized factory work. In describing uh, what the physical conditions were in the plant, a lot of workers mentioned the uh, temperature extremes. One woman said, the heat was horrible. God love them, they really should have thought that out a little better, but there was no air conditioning, really. They would pump in fresh air, and it was somewhat cooler, but it wasn't air conditioned. The winters were kind of cool in there as well because they didn't heat it very well. It was an older building and just not really set up for heating and cooling very well. And the work was really physically demanding. As one woman said to me, oh man, I worked my butt off. I worked second shift, had a newborn. I worked in what's called the press room. The press room takes a long sheets of steel and we just press them into all the different parts for the washer or the dryer. Some of the sheets were as long as like from this table to the end of that and it would have to be two of us lifting or it might be cut in half and it would be two lifting on one side and one pulling out on the other and I worked really hard. I worked really hard. I'm going to give you an example of how hard I worked. I weigh, I had just had my daughter and I was almost 230 pounds. After a year of working there, I weighed 130 pounds and I didn't work out anywhere. Just working there in that press room, I lost 100 pounds. A lot of longtime employees remembered how bad the plant conditions had been in the uh, early 1970s. Uh, one of them described when he started there, he said, this was Dodge City. You go in the plant and the plant was nasty and filthy and had steam and gunk flying around in the air. I remember watching secretaries walk through there and he'd have forklifts bringing containers, especially in the machine shop. They had containers that they would be going through there and it would drip oil. After a while, when it gets pounded down by the wheels like that, it turns into a paste. I'd watch these secretaries try to walk through there and they'd lose their shoes in the stuff. And the work took a long-term uh, long physical toll on a lot of the workers. Uh, most of the employees were on their feet for their entire shifts. And uh, for a lot of years, they stood on bare concrete floors. 
One woman described to me, she said, there's hardly any sit-down jobs in a factory like that. Very rare. I was on my feet all day long. They didn't come out with mats until several years after I was there. You were basically just on the concrete floor. And then they did bring out some mats. First set of mats they brought out were like a rug. Then you stand on that and you just wear it down. But then they did finally get the good mats, the thicker ones. It has like holes in them. They give you support, but yet you can't mash them down. But that was much later. And because we were on our feet all the time, and I'm sure my weight didn't help any. I mean, I wasn't always heavy, but still, you got gravity pushing on you, pulling you down. I got really bad varicose veins, and the main veins, they said, they probably have to go in and have stents put in them because I don't have the right blood flow. Evidently, the blood goes down, but it don't want to come back up, and they said, that's from the veins. So I need to go see a cardiovascular surgeon, but I don't have health insurance, so that's just going to have to be by the wayside for a while. Other workers suffered uh, repetitive motion injuries, as one told me. Everything out there was repetitive motion. I have a shoulder that's messed up because of that. You know, like I said, you're using a grinder all day long. Like, say you put out 3,200 pumps a day, which is not unusual. You're bringing that grinder down not just 3,200 times because you bring it down once and start to cut, and you had to let it go, and then bring it down again and start to cut. And the third time is when you buried it, and it went where it was supposed to go and stopped. Okay, 3,200 times three, at least times three. So I messed my shoulder up. There came a point to where we either had bad steel or I had bad blades on that cutter because it wouldn't cut. I mean, you actually had to pull down on it. You were actually making it do the job that it just so easily should be. It should be like cutting butter, and I was having to just haul butt to get it down, and my shoulder just wouldn't go anymore one day. It was done. That was it. And I had to go have physical therapy and work with a different pull of rubber bands and stuff. I think they said there was a muscle and tendon or something that was kind of like wrapped around each other, and they just got all messed up. It, it's like it catches on something and then it lets go. So there's something going on in the shoulder, but <laughs> I'm living with it because I can still use it. It's, it's all right. Yeah, I'll, I'll live with it. In addition to the uh, repetitive motion injuries, a lot of the workers suffered uh, trauma from accidents. Uh, one showed me a long scar on her arm and explained how it happened while opening a cardboard container. She said, I've got nine stitches across and seven on the inside and this little scar. I was working in one of the, they call them sheets of metal. They're sharp as razors. I mean, I just bumped it and it cut my arm open like that. And then, then I cut my arm here. That was crazy. A straight razor. We had to, you know, open all your materials and stuff. And our razors had been dull for months. And so you get used to using a certain amount of force. You just get used to using a certain amount of force. This is dull. And well, someone changed our razors and they were nice. And we came in using that same force and just gone away from me. Now, I don't want it to sound like they were complaining about the physical toll of the work. Nobody brought it up unless I asked them about it. Um, uh, on the other hand, a whole lot of the workers brought up the uh, sense of community that developed among the co-workers. Um, as one woman told me co-workers were really quick to lend support to colleagues that they thought were making a good faith effort, uh, creating a sense of community that transcended age, race, gender. I mean, this is an African-American woman, and she's telling me, the work atmosphere with the employees to me was awesome. It was kind of a team, and depending on what department you worked in, it was kind of a family. Each department had its own family, and, and Maytag was the mother and the father, and each department you worked in, for instance, were the brothers and sisters, and we were all the kids. Like, I worked in a press room, so we were all a family, and we networked within ourselves. People were really good about helping one another if you were a worker. If you were a worker. If you were not a worker, you probably wouldn't be there long. People would rally with a new employee and help them stay. It was that kind of thing. Nobody wanted to see anybody get fired or lose their jobs or anything like that unless you had an attitude where you just didn't care. And you didn't care about the work you put out or whatever. And after that, people just kind of let you deal with it accordingly. But as long as you were a worker, they helped out everybody. And they helped me a lot. And the expectations were really simple. Nobody asked you to be the Incredible Hulk or Wonder Woman or anything like that. Maytag was so full of these old cats, and they came from the military. They could just see the heart of the thing. It's like the heart, the eye of the tiger. When they saw that, no matter what, you won't give up. You had the eye of the tiger. They'll cover you. They'll say, okay, do this. It'll help you out. 
a lot of them, and remembering this sense of community that developed, uh, they said that it, the community often fostered a kind of party atmosphere. And, and some of them said this sort of critically and some, uh, you know, supportively. But as one former employee told me, the partying was rampant right before holidays, you know, before Christmas vacation. And so they really cracked down on that. There were no drug tests, no alcohol tests, nothing like that when I first walked in. It was just a wide open sort of a frontier type attitude, like, you know, that Wild West type of thing. Another described the work discipline when he started in 1989. He said, it was like a big party there in 89. I was kind of taken aback. I mean, people were lighting up reefer underneath the line at break time or going out at lunch and getting a fifth of Jack coming in. And I was surprised there were more accidents there. And the bosses knew of it happening, you know, and they didn't do anything about it. I mean, standing for eight hours putting screws in is just a mind-numbing chore. But it's something that has to be done, and it's good to be able to break it up the routine with something like that every now and then. There were sexcapades on the roof and in the bathrooms, and then it was an old place. It had a lot of little cubby holes, and there was actually an old train car caboose that was in one area where they used to unload steel, and people would go in that one, and it'd be a big dope hangout place. Some people had jobs that would allow them freedom to roam about pretty much when they wanted to as long as they got their work done. I used to work in that area and I'd go back and clean up stuff and I'd get the smell of reefer flowing through the air back there. So I know that it did happen and as far as people on break time underneath the line, I saw that happen, things like that. But they were happy workers. <laughs> Over time, though, management uh, took steps to cut back on this party atmosphere, and uh, drug tests began to be instituted, and management ended the tradition of workers' holiday potlucks. Uh, as uh, one person said, it really damaged the morale. We used to have on certain occasions or certain holidays we worked, or, or right before, because we had most holidays off, which is a good thing, people would bring in potluck stuff, and we'd have parties. They'd start coming, cutting that stuff out, and... That kind of takes away from the morale, I thought, and most of us thought. It just seemed like it was more business-like. Not that it shouldn't be that way, it is. Uh, I mean, you need to allow human beings to have a little fun here and there at work. They used to give us shifts for these products and for these potlucks, and they'd give us an hour for lunch and not pay us for it, but like I said, they'd give us an hour and then they'd cut that. It just seemed like they were streamlining everything, including us having a little bit of fun at work and enjoying the time we're there. All right, as we said, you know, close to half the factory's workforce used the benefits package negotiated by the union to go to school for retraining. Um, but the entire process of unemployment and retraining was complicated by, you know, what we can call the pig and the python effect. Um, as one worker told me, losing your job is one thing. Losing your job with seven or eight hundred people simultaneously was a shock because everybody was going to be going after pretty much the same jobs. So, a lot of people expressed pride to me in how well they had done at school. One woman uh, captured the mixed sense of accomplishment and disappointment that a lot of worker students experienced. She said, I went to school for two years and I enjoyed that. I'll tell you what, that was a high and a low for me. The high was I went to college. It would have never happened, you know. I did good in college and I was proud of myself. Got out of there thinking I was going to come out and kick some butt and get a job at what I went to school for and stuff. And let me tell you, it didn't happen. So I asked, what'd you study? Medical administrative assistant, me and about three or four hundred other people. I mean, there was a lot of us, a lot of us. And some did find jobs, but I'm here to tell you I bet 90% didn't. I got out and immediately went and put in applications, went to work at a gas station. That's humbling as hell, let me tell you. Went to work at a gas station for a while. Then I got a call. A friend was working down at a nursing home in the offices, and they needed somebody in dietary, and she told them that she knew somebody that would be really good. And they hired me, and I've been there three years now. But that's not been my goal in life either, because, you know, I didn't go to school for two years to work in dietary. I mean, you can do that without nothing. But no, school was, how do I want to say this? I was elated. I remember the day of graduation, I looked around and I just cried. I was just bursting. I was so happy. I accomplished a lot in two years, but not for what I need to help me out with because I can't find work in that. And I'm not saying it's not out there. 
Maybe it's my age. You know, when I got out of college, I was 51. You go look in a doctor's office and stuff, and you see a lot of younger people in there, and they're not giving up their jobs. Why would they? They're family jobs. That's what they probably went to school for while they're here. They're not going to give them up, and that's just not, there's just not enough doctor's offices around to fulfill all the jobs. So, yeah, that was a high and a low two years there. Others uh, face similar problems in other fields with the saturated job market. Um, one man explained the problems with getting a job in information technology. He said, I was glad Mantra Takan gave us the two years of free schooling. Uh, but some people in nursing and stuff, they were able to take off from the two years. With IT, it's really hard to get a job in this area with just two years of schooling. So this guy borrowed money to finish an undergraduate degree at SIU. And then on graduating from SIU, he found out that, again, the glut of information technology graduates had driven wages way down. He said, in this area, I can tell you now, the IT is not really there. The positions are there, but they're really low pay. I think there was an IT job here at Logan that was $10 an hour, a little over $10 an hour. That's not enough pay, I don't think. But I guess in this area, that's what they think wages should be. All right, as I said, you know, my inspiration for undertaking this project was uh, I wanted to talk to former workers, students, and, and find out what their interpretation was of, of why they ended up in this position, why uh, uh, Whirlpool bought the plant from Maytag with the idea of closing it down. And so a lot of workers pointed out that Maytag had been trying to find ways to cut costs for a lot of years. Um, part of the attempt to cut costs was they had started shipping departments from the factory down to Mexico where labor costs were lower. Uh, one of them said to me, for a period of time, Maytag had been farming out departments to other facilities, and they had a big sister facility down in Reynosa in Mexico. When they cut the machine shop down over here, that was pretty much like cutting the heart out of the plant. But he went on to point out that making products in Mexico with lower labor costs didn't end up saving Maytag any money. He said, they were trying to save money. They were trying to do that, and it turned out they had this big plan on how to get them down there, make them cheap, and ship the completed transmissions back up here and save money, which worked out real well until the price of gas went up. They lost their butt after that. Some people talked about how old the plant was, um, how old the equipment was, um, its location being in the center of town instead of out on an interstate as, as reasons leading to, to uh, the plant being closed. Others pointed out that the uh, housing market had been declining for several years, which meant people were buying fewer appliances. Um, and other people just said Maytag made a lot of bad business decisions. But, you know, some workers tried to place the shutdown in a broader context of globalization and the, the accompanying war on American labor unions. One of them told me that the decision was part of an effort to undermine the power of labor unions. He said, I feel they're trying to get rid of all unions, and I understand that it's all about the shareholders. They want to make profits for them, so you've got to go to a country where it allows more pollution and doesn't have the high wages and you don't have to worry about insurance and taking care of the workers as much. I'm kind of jaded that, by thinking that way, it's, but that it's all about money for the shareholders and the owners or whoever, maybe. Um, another one was telling me that factory workers in, at the Heron plant were caught in an ongoing effort to get the American to gut the American middle class by destroying the power of labor and putting American workers in competition with low paid workers around the world, uh, a process that was uh, accelerated by uh, agreements like the North American Free Trade Act in the 1990s and other free trade agreements since then. Uh, he said to me, a major issue with me is the disparity between income levels of higher income Upper level, the 99 compared to the 1%. That's a big political statement now, but you do the math. Back in the 60s and early 70s, the average CEO was making 25 to 50 times what the average floor worker was in their factory, average worker in their, their firm, corporation, was making. He was making 25 to 50 times more. Now it's four to 500 times. 
So to justify those huge salaries, you have to cut somebody's wages because the profits, you know, you can't raise your prices to where you can't sell your product. So how are you going to do that? Well, you have to cut it somewhere. So you cut out the middle class. You eliminate the unionized worker. And then he goes on to say, you know, organized labor has sat meekly and allowed itself to be gutted. And when I ask, well, where should you have seen this whole process beginning? He said, when Ronald Reagan eliminated the air traffic controllers union and the unions didn't really respond because it was a government union, a public service union. So the rest of the organized labor didn't really respond a whole lot. There were a few naysayers, but there was none of this retrenchment and let's get this guy out of there. He got reelected by a landslide the second time around. It seemed to me that that was kind of a green light. They realized they could just start picking here and picking there and not hit the whole organized labor at once, but just hit here, there, a little bit, just these small agreements. It's like putting a frog in boiling water. If you drop him in there, he's going to jump right out. But if you just set him in there and just turn the heat up slowly until it hits boiling, he'll sit in there until he's dead. And that's what they did to organized labor. They just did it piece by piece by piece. So under various names, uh, Maytag factory uh, was the centerpiece of the Heron economy for 60 years. Uh, provided a large number of high paying union jobs, mostly for people who just had a high school education. I mean, this one worker told me his experience, which was very typical of, of his age. He said, um, I graduated from Heron High School on a Thursday, and Monday I went to work at Maytag, or Norge at the time. Norge actually came to the high school, had an assembly, had people fill out applications while you're still in high school, and then when you graduated, they called you in. You just went to work. City leaders in Heron have argued that the shutdown didn't have nearly as bad an impact on the local economy as people feared it would. There was a, an upbeat story in 2010 in USA Today in which uh, Heron was held up as a model for other towns facing similar job losses. And this USA Today story pointed out that the town's population has increased since the plant, and proper, uh, plant closed and property and sales taxes haven't really uh, gone down. So the view of the business community is that we're losing our industrial job base, but it's all being replaced by jobs in the healthcare industry, which is growing rapidly. And the advantage of healthcare jobs is they can't be uh, exported. Not surprisingly, the um, workers didn't see quite such a rosy picture. Uh, one of them told me, you know what really drives me nuts? It's when the mayor actually made this statement that was in the paper that the shutdown of Maytag didn't really hurt this town. Is he an idiot or what? You know it did. You know the money flow's not here like it was. You know. The first couple, three years, yeah, maybe not have looked quite so bad because people were on unemployment and they were being paid to go to school, so there was still some money floating around. But now you got people. I know the people that haven't found a job yet, or they're too damn picky and won't take just any job, one way or another, but I know some people that still don't have jobs. Uh, and this woman went on to argue that, you know, the idea that the healthcare industry and the growth of jobs in healthcare industry um, is going to replace the jobs that we lost with the closing of the various factories, um, it doesn't take into account the realities of the local economy. She said, I realize that all the baby boomers are getting old now and they're going to be needing care and whatnot, but I haven't seen new doctor's offices open or expand and things like what I went to school for. Nursing homes maybe, but the cost of the nursing home and the fact that the state doesn't pay any money, you'd be surprised how many people are just taking other people in at home. They're just doing the best they can because you can't afford to go out at Shawnee Christian and pay $4,500 a month, you know. You just can't do it. And with the state not paying, I don't know anything about the financial side of that place, but I do know that if you're just depending on your Social Security and Medicare, you can't pay. It ain't happening. This one worker summarized the situation. Uh, it's been like a violation of the, the social contract, a violation even of the uh, American dream. He said, it was a good bunch of people, you know, salt of the earth type people. They just wanted a decent living to take care of their families. They didn't want to be rich. They didn't want to conquer the world. 
They just wanted a good, decent job that paid enough that they could take good care of their families. Personally, I don't see how that's too much to ask. But apparently it is anymore in today's world. You see it all the time. Manufacturing's making a comeback, making a comeback. You know, what are they paying? We were making 15 to $20 an hour, very good benefits, pension plan, good insurance. What are these new factories that are opening up? What are they paying? $10 an hour, no benefits. So yeah, they're bringing manufacturing back, but they've already broke the back of organized labor. So what are they gonna pay? Minimum wage, no pensions, no some form of 401k maybe. Can you raise a family? Can you support a family with that? That's the question. Is that too much to ask, a decent wage so you can support your family? To me, that's not too much to ask. For a company that wants to do business in the United States, at least pay a living wage for their employees. One woman summed up the contradictory attitudes of a whole lot of the workers. She said, do I miss the place? No. Do I miss the money? Oh, yeah. Do I miss the benefits? Yeah. Do I miss the wear and tear on my body? No. No, I don't miss that place. Just the benefits and the money. Thank you. I'll take any questions or comments if you got any. Uh, yeah. <coughs> question about relocation because there was some talk about offering some of the employees jobs elsewhere. Everybody I talked to, uh, the ones who said they asked if they could relocate were told they couldn't. I just wondered if it was management that was relocated. Um, I think to the extent that anybody was, it would have been. So, yeah. Yeah, Mick. I interviewed, I think, 25, so a small number, but uh, fairly representative. Yeah, Ava. Out of those 25, were there any that felt that this was the best thing that could have happened? Yeah. Um, a lot of people did say this turned out to be a blessing in disguise, um, that uh, a few of them, and one thing that impressed me was how many had always meant to go to college or maybe even started going to college and then got a job at the factory with the idea, I'm only going to work here for a few years, but you know, often ended up working here 30 years or so because the pay and the benefits were so tempting to just stay there. And then they, they would, uh, I had a handful say, yeah, it turned out to be a good thing because I had always meant to go to college, and, um, I, but I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't been forced to here. So. Yeah, Sarah. I, I don't have any idea, no. Um, I haven't looked, I'm not sure. And, you know, I'm, I kind of, I guess, in what I was saying here, it sounded like I was focusing almost exclusively on the city of Heron, which is where the plant was. But the, um, the uh, people came from all over southern Illinois to work there. So, um, and the impact in Heron may not have been as terrible as it you know, it might have seemed, but on the other hand, there was a ripple effect all throughout um, Southern Illinois. A friend of mine worked at a, a health food store in Carterville uh, that closed down within six months or so after the factory closed because people driving in to work at the factory were a big part of their customer base. And so they, uh, so the unemployment, I mean, it kind of ripples beyond just the actual factory workers. Entrepreneurs got a lot of press. Did you talk to anybody who started his own business or her business? I'm trying to think. The businesses they started, that, the ones I talked to were very small scale, like breeding particular uh, uh, the one that types of dogs. I and remember so. five guys from the line got together and they, they rebuilt the turf machine. Okay. Um, I, and I'm thinking, and I mean, part of the joy of this was the different location. I had people invite me into their houses. I, I sat on the front porch with this one guy talking with him while it was raining there. And, and I would, I, you know, if people wanted to meet at a bar, I'd buy them beer as long as they wanted to talk or meet at a coffee shop, I'd buy them coffee. Um, 
So, I mean, it was really fun, but I remember sitting on the front porch of this one guy and talking with him. He and some buddies had gone into um, uh, construction. They, they were um, Greg Walker students here, and they went in, they opened their own construction business, uh, but it didn't last very long, and his health issues that he had developed the years of working at uh, the factory uh, ended up leading him to, to have to quit that, and I think uh, the business fell apart shortly after that. Yeah, Ken. To what extent did you find your expectations were confirmed, and then what surprised you? Um, and at all kinds of levels, I kept finding that I had a really simplistic view. Uh, as I was saying, you know, my, my interpretation of what scientifically managed work is like was challenged at every sort of level that it's not really that difficult and I was told yeah it it is I mean not just physically but intellectually it is too but also you know the people can take pride in their products which I had always told students they don't um, so at that level um, at levels like what Abel was asking um, how many people told me yeah this turned out to be kind of the best thing that could have happened to me. I didn't have a lot of people say that, but the fact that anybody would say that surprised me. Um, and I, one thing that struck me was how, how hard everybody worked to be fair to Whirlpool. It's like, I understand what they would think. I kind of understand. It's like, no, I would be so pissed off. It's like, you took my job, you took my life. But these people were all very measured. And I, I had none of the kind of anger I thought I might. Uh, a different, a month after the certainly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> certainly. Um, Tom. Yeah, you may have addressed this earlier, I came in late, but did any, at any point did anyone kind of challenge uh, the education that they received or the process of, of schools of business in terms of preparing them for life? At one point you mentioned a woman said, I went to school for X, but I was a, or to the gas station, etc. So I wonder if at any, at any point someone said, I don't know if my schooling would have you prepared me for being more adaptable in life beyond you know, manual yeah, I had some, and the stories are all so individualized. And that's, an, getting back to your question, Katie, is something that, you know, it's easy for historians when we talk about the workers to talk about them as an undifferentiated mass. And that's why talking to 25 different people, and getting 25 different stories, it reminds you that everybody's story is different. But yeah, I had some, um, and again, uh, uh, I'm not sure when you came in, but I was talking about the fact that we're producing so many um, people all at the same time because getting laid off with 700 or 800 or 900 other people, uh, there just aren't that many jobs here. Um, but um, some people, this one woman um, went into, um, what was it, like travel, how, what, what was I telling Travel and tourism. Yeah, travel and tourism. And she said, it was a great degree program. I, I loved it. Problem is, nobody comes to Southern Illinois for tourism, so there's no tourist industry uh, down here. So it didn't do me any good, um, you know. And uh, um, another thing that I, mean, I kind of knew intellectually, but was driven home, is people will often say, "Well, why don't if there are no jobs here, why don't they move to where the jobs are?" Well, talking to people about the different stories they have, why they can't move. I've got you know, family here, I'm taking care of a sick mother, or I'm in a divorce uh, and we share, I share custody with my ex and I'm not allowed to leave the state. Um, so, I mean, just that sort of simplistic thing, well, why don't you move if you can't find jobs here, kind of boils down to there are a hundred reasons why people can't move. Did you get a sense of what they thought of our college? Everybody loved it. Everybody was really grateful to Mantracon for the services it provided, though some people thought Mantracon was overwhelmed. They had never dealt with anything of this scale before. And uh, they were, at the same time, kind of overlapping this group, they were hit with other 
uh, factory closures. And so, yeah, they were just overwhelmed. Um, but everybody uh, praised the education they got here, uh, even, if, even if it didn't, you know, lead to the promised job. And the one woman I was talking about, the one who said she cried when she graduated and she was so proud of herself, uh, but then ended up working at a gas station. Now is working in, in a dietary at a nursing home. She said, um, you know, she, um, you know, she, she loved the education. She loved that, but it, it didn't do her any good. So, um, but just the fact that she went to college made her really proud of herself. Sarah, you had a question. Did anybody hold John responsible for them not finding a job? Like, no. Like a job placement program or anything? No, not, uh, not the college. So some people did blame Mantracon, which was the, uh, so they thought they didn't get good advice, that Mantracon didn't warn them that the jobs weren't going to be there, that if we train, I don't know how many hundred medical transcriptionists, the, the, the area here can't support that many. Uh, so, yeah. So some people were a little mad at, at the, the company that's overseeing uh, their education and, and administering the grant. But nobody was mad uh, at Logan. And a woman who went into uh, tourism, uh, she said, I put everything off. I was like the last person. I decided to go into nursing, but all the nursing positions had been filled up. So tourism was pretty much all that was left available for me. So do you have another question? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Yeah, MJ. Were you surprised that they're not a woman who worked there? You seem to mention a lot. Um, not really. Um, do you know what the ratio is? I, I don't. Does anybody know what, do you know, Deb, what the ratio of men to women working at the factory was? No. I've been on the floor before, and there were plenty of women yeah. working. They, and now, they always have been. Yeah, but they did talk about there were certain certain positions that were sort of set aside for men, and a few women talked about having to fight to get in those jobs. The big presses were very dangerous to women. Yeah. And the one woman, the one who lost 100 pounds in her first uh, year there, she, um, um, she was the one talking about the sense of community and how everybody would help you out if they saw you were really trying. Um, she was an African-American woman, and all the people she worked with, she said, were just small town, southern Illinois, older southern Illinois white boys. Uh, but that this sense of community expand they didn't care as long as she tried they would help her out so I mean she uh, so in those ways yeah um, I wasn't really surprised and I'm not exactly sure what the ratio would be it wasn't quite half and half okay. it was a lower percentage female but it was right around 45 percent 45 percent okay so and we did have females operating the big presses. Yeah, um, but they, had, they didn't always. They kind of had to, to work to do that. Um, and one woman drove uh, one of the, uh, the, the forklifts, and she said that there were only like two women doing that when she started doing it, uh, though more women started doing it over the years. So. Christy, real quickly. Uh-huh. And that affected her because they were the sports that they were not going to negotiate the part because they were essentially Oh wow. And it affected her when she became a union rep to say, you know, we can't negotiate hard, we've got to make this work because otherwise you're gonna fire all of us. Uh huh. And it made a big question across the board yeah. and that line of work and a lot of other yeah. Magdalena. Yeah, I'm just interested if there was any like increase in crime of people. Um, I don't know. I, in, in our neighborhood, uh, we lived in a neighborhood, and, and the neighborhood took a pretty sharp downturn uh, in the period after. And our neighbors uh, worked at uh, Maytag and. and uh, they lost their house pretty quickly, and the house turned into a meth house. Um, um, and across the street, there were you know, drug dealers moved in. So, it just purely anecdotal, uh, we saw our neighborhood go down fast 
uh, afterwards. But I don't know how. If you drive around here and now, you see a lot of empty houses. Um, in fact, a lot of empty lots where houses have been raised because they were just allowed to decay. So, Lord, you're good. Yeah. I was going to say, that's a, that's a growth industry in here and now. Uh, so, um, anyway, real quick, then I'm going to go teach another class in a minute. So, yeah. Um, did you talk to any of the people that took an early retirement because of the factory closing down? Yeah, um, I did. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, it's been a couple of years since I did these interviews, so I'm trying to remember exactly what their stories were. But yeah, some people did. Um, so, why? Did you, was there more well, questions? My, my uncle, he, he retired. Okay, so he decided not to go on to school just because of yeah. his age or something? He felt like there was nothing else for him with okay. the job that he was All just right. machine for. All right, see you, sister. Mm -hmm. so. Some people held out thinking they were going to find a comparable job, so they were, the time was ticking away. Yeah when they could access that money. Okay. okay, yeah, and other people held out just because I think they were in shock, like this woman who couldn't decide what to do and then finally came here and all that was left was tourism as a, a degree program. So uh, um, she's, you know, she was like 25 and, and just sort of, you know, like you know, this deer in the headlines look. Christy. They notified him in May, I think that they were going to close at Christmas. Um, but boy, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to buy an appliance bought during that uh, eight, eight months or, or whatever. Um, the, um, it's interesting because Whirlpool that bought Maytag, and we we're all real excited in here, and it's like, welcome Whirlpool, but they bought it pretty much with the idea of shutting it down. But Whirlpool is based in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and that's my mother's hometown. And my grandmother and several of my relatives worked at the Whirlpool factory back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, and so my sister living in California saw this story in the paper with a Benton Harbor headline, uh, you know, from Benton Harbor, but then the story is like Heron, Major. It's like, I never thought I'd see those two cities that I have a personal connection to. Uh, in the same story, so. You know, they closed three plants, Iowa, Heron, and Arkansas, yeah. and moved to Ohio. And they mo and Three years later, I was there doing an accreditation visit, and they were closing down that plant. Yeah, and the one in Evansville, the Whirlpool plant yeah, that I, my, our daughter went to school in Evansville, so I used to drive by that all the time to go take her or pick her up, and it was thriving for the first few years, and then I drove by and it was shut down, too, so. When Maytag was closed at Galesburg, um, they told um, my one president and I were at a meeting that night. And she said, something really big is happening tomorrow. All these big ones are coming in. So I guess I'll be invited to this meeting. And then later, I drove up from our little town through the factory. The road actually went through the factory. And the people were just standing out in the grass, just stunned, because they had been told in the next fall that they were to come in. They were told they could come in here, or they could go to Iowa. That's what that only happened last before last year. Yeah. I think the new town of uh, Iowa was hit even harder than Heron. Uh, and uh, Benton Harbor has been hit even uh, harder. And Benton Harbor has turned, uh, because of white flight, has turned mostly in, into an African-American city. So you got all the class issues that Heron is experiencing, plus uh, race issues. Uh, so. um, the whole sense of self yeah. was just yeah. shattered. Yeah, and getting back to whoever asked about school here, I mean, that was one thing we did do. I mean, we didn't always provide jobs, but I think we did provide a sense of, of self. And like the woman I was talking about, how proud she was. She had gone to college, she did well, she never thought she would be able to do that. And, um, you know, I wish we could give them all jobs, uh, but if nothing else, you know, we did provide that for a lot of people. All right, yeah, my pleasure.